Good evening uh, and welcome. This is a wonderful showing. So many people here, it's terrific. Our first in-person event in some time and uh, it's so nice to talk to so many of you. Um, my name is Sandy Marsters and I'm the president of the board. I welcome you and thank you so much for being here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And um, <laughs> to gather as friends in person no less and conduct a little bit of business. I wanna extend my gratitude to owners Amy Sam Abby Samuelson and Matt Dunlap and to Abby's mom Board member, uh, board member for life, Joni Benoit Samuelson, for sharing this gorgeous venue um, with us. Please give them a hand. I'm proud to serve on, on the board of this wonderful organization. I live in Portland where I have an expansive view of Back Cove from my home. I turn to that view often uh, during the day to gauge the wind and the tide, enjoy a sunset, or simply to contemplate. For a deeper dive, I head out on my powerboat to explore the bay and contemplate some more. I love this place, I am privileged to enjoy it, and I, like you, am committed to protecting and improving it. Despite challenges, we have had a great year. We have brought on talented new staff, and brought on a skilled new executive director, Will Everett. Please give Will a hand. We have deepened and diversified the board with new members whom you will meet tonight. We are in very, very good hands. We also, have some, we also have some new friends of the Bay in the audience tonight, so for them, and to refresh our own memories, here is a brief rundown of what we do. Our mission is to improve and protect the environmental health of the Bay. We do that through science, advocacy, and engaging community members like you uh, to help our efforts. On the science front, we have 22 sites across the bay at which we do checkups spring through fall, measuring temperature, pH, to gauge how acidic our waters are, salinity, how salty the water is, dissolved oxygen, because all, th all living creatures need oxygen uh, to survive and other important parameters on the bay's health. We have three continuous monitoring stations in waters off Port uh, in Portland Harbor, off Yarmouth, at the center of the bay and off Harpswell at the eastern end of the bay. These stations measure key climate change indicators every 24 hours, every 24 hours, every hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We put all the science to great, great to good use. Casco Bay Keeper Ivy Fernyoka, right there. Our, our, our Lead advocate and uh, our other staff use these data to identify problems and advocate for solutions to pollution, climate change, and other issues the Bay faces. We cannot do this work alone. It takes a community, or in the case of Casco Bay Watershed, 41 communities from Cape Elizabeth and Phippsburg West up the watershed to Bethel to take care of our waters. All of you here tonight are so critical to our work. Thank you. So now for the next hour, we're gonna do our business portion of the meeting. No, just kidding. <laughs> this should take about three minutes and the information that was on your chair um, uh, and the blue pages uh, you'll be referring to. So here's our annual meeting. Here's our annual meeting. Please take out the blue sheet, turn it to the side with the minutes of the 2021 annual meeting. I now ask the clerk of our board, Pat Iani. Madam Clerk, are the minutes in order? Yes? Is that a yes? Good, thank you. I now need approval of the minutes by those present. All in favor of accepting the minutes of the 2021 annual meeting, please say aye. aye. Very good, thank you. Now I direct you to the other side of the blue sheet. 
First, I would like to recognize and thank board members with, who, who transitioned off the board this year. Jack Thomas, who couldn't be here tonight, and Lori Thayer, who is here tonight. Lori, could you stand up or raise your hand or something? There she is. Uh, both of whom served on the, uh, as dedicated board members for the last nine years. Jack and Lori, your service has made a difference in the health of the organization and the health of the Bay. Next, we move to the election slate of the board of directors. New directors are elected by the board during the year and, notif and uh, ratified at the membership at each me uh, by the membership at each meeting. Directors serve three-year terms and they are limited to three consecutive terms. There are three parts to this and we would like uh, to move these as a slate. It's warm up here. Um, during the board, uh, join, during the year, uh, the board brought on five new directors and you will be asked to elect them for their first full three-year term. If these people could stand up when I call their name, that would be great. Deb DeBegan, is Deb here? There's Deb. Um, Ellen Grant, is Ellen here? Okay, um, Howard Gray, who is out here, come to the door. Uh, Megan Hallett, is Megan here? There's Megan, hi Megan, thank you. Uh, and Kirsten Piacentini. Kirsten? Aha, uh -huh. thank you. I would entertain a motion to move this slate of nominations. And seconded. I now call for a vote of the membership. All those in favor? Thank you. Would all members of the board please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Almost done. Uh, and thanks to the board for, um, uh, for your service uh, to, um, and your service to the mission. Now I will give a brief financial report. Our financials ending March 31, 2021 are in the annual report, which you have. Um, I ask Malcolm Poole, treasurer of the board, um, are our financials in order? Very good, sir. Thank you. And I'll just read you some, uh, some details of that. Uh, Friends of Casco Bay closed FY21 on March 31, 2021 with an operating surplus of $4,423 before depreciation totaling $42,481, a non-cash expense. We house four funds that support our work at the Maine Community Foundation. Those funds are the Baykeeping Fund, the Boats Fund, the Emeritus Fund for Advocacy, and the Climate Change and Casco Bay Fund. These four funds contributed $330,000, $330,869 to program operations for our fiscal year. The Community Foundation has stewarded these funds well and even uh, with withdrawals to operations, we saw an overall increase in the balance of the funds at year end. The organization remains in a strong financial position. Thank you, all of you, for your investment in the health of the Bay, and thank you for your confidence in the organization. This concludes the annual meeting portion of the evening, and I'll now turn things over to our executive director, Will Everett. We are water, we are the bay. What happens to water happens to us. My name is Will Everett and I'm the executive director of Friends of Casco Bay. 
And <laughs> it feels really good to say that. Uh, and here we are uh, in New Gloucester. Uh, we don't have a view of the bay, but we are in the bay's watershed. And what happens to water happens to us. If we poured water out on this lawn, we kept on pouring water out on that lawn, that water would flow downhill and it would flow to the Royal River. From the Royal River, it would wind its way and make it into the bay. And I just want to take this moment for us to recognize that what happens here and what happens from Bethel, as far west as Bethel, to the bay, uh, Cape Elizabeth to Pittsburgh, uh, what happens in those 41 towns can have an impact on the bay. We are water, we are the bay. What happens to water happens to us. Those words I keep repeating were written uh, by um, Gulf of Maine poet Gary Lawless in honor of our 30th anniversary three years ago. And I'm gonna share how those words written three years ago uh, actually uh, anticipated much of the work uh, that we've been doing over the past year. So I'm going to share about that. I have some important thank yous to share as well. Uh, but first, I'm just going to take a few moments to share how in the world I got here standing in front of you tonight. Um, most of you know me as Friends of Casco Bay's development director, which I've been over the past 16 years. Allow me tonight to reintroduce myself to you as our executive director. Uh, some of you uh, know that I grew up on a, on a fruit farm, an Everett's fruit farm. I grew up as a little kid picking strawberries, corn, picking apples, making cider uh, on a 120-year-old uh, cider uh, press on a farm that my 82-year-old dad still runs today. And those were really formative years. And uh, growing up on Everett's fruit farm, uh, I learned a lot of things. I, I, I learned to love nature uh, and a connection with the earth. Uh, and I also gained a pers farmer's perspective of time. It takes five years from planting an apple tree to when it bears fruit. Um, and uh, I, I carry that long-term thinking with me. Um, but growing up on a farm, that didn't make me an environmentalist. I didn't really think about the environment, actually. I went away to college. I always wanted to be a teacher, a social studies teacher, and I went to uh, college, and my life was well on its way. Uh, senior year, I had a job. Uh, right, I had secured a job before graduation for that fall to teach social studies. But it began to bother me a little bit with a little perspective away from the farm of the old school ways that I grew up on a farm doing. Uh, and some of the old school ways that were actually harming the nature and the land that I grew up on. You have to keep in mind that I had my commercial applicator, pesticide, commercial pesticide applicator's license. I got about the same time I got my driver's license. So uh, a little perspective at college, I realized that, wow, that's kind of crazy. Uh, another thing happened right before I graduated. I went to a talk by Noam Chomsky, who is a political gadfly. Uh, he normally gives talks on uh, uh, politics and uh, international relations. He gave a talk about the environment right before I graduated. Uh, and uh, you don't have to know Noam Chomsky, but every Noam Chomsky talk is problem after problem after problem after problem. For two hours, I sat through him listing all sorts of problems. He took questions at the end. I was the first at the mic. Uh, Professor Chomsky, um, you just spoke for two hours about a bunch of problems. Uh, what are we supposed to do about it? Are you graduating soon? Uh, yes, Professor Chomsky, next month. Go work for an organization that's working on this stuff. Uh, OK. Uh, Professor Chomsky. Uh, which organizations are working on this stuff? And he rattled off 30 organizations. That summer, I went to work for one. Some people do the Peace Corps. This was going to be my summer for the environment, and I was going to go teach. I worked on an environmental campaign in New Jersey to stop the rollback of the uh, Clean Water Act, New Jersey's Clean Water Act. 
New Jersey has the strictest uh, Clean Water Act laws in the nation because, let's face it, they need it. <laughs> and as a community organizer, I was knocking on doors, I was getting volunteers to write the governor, to write letters to the editor. We had an awesome campaign team. It was awesome. It was fun. In July, I called the school I was going to teach out. Uh, yeah, I can't take that job. My summer for the environment, I was going to make it a year for the environment. That year has turned into 26 years for the environment. And, and, the, uh, and in the early days, I would go wherever they needed me as an organizer. So I, I worked on clean air issues in Ohio. I worked fighting Exxon in Alaska. Uh, I worked on forestry issues in Vermont. I worked cleaning up, uh, worked with community groups, clean up hazardous waste sites in Massachusetts. In 1999, I moved to Maine. If you're not from Maine, some of you move here for the forest and the hiking and the mountains. Some of you move here for the coast, right? Casco Bay, maybe even. Uh, I moved here for the toxic sludge, the pesticide spraying, air pollution. I was working with community groups uh, across the state with Community Action Works, uh, working to, to fight these bad things in our neighborhood. And for the first time in my life, I felt at home in Maine. And as I put down roots, I realized I, I wanted to work for a group that was working in my community. And in 2006, I got that chance. Uh, I uh, started working with Friends of Casco Bay. And that was uh, Kathy Ramstel was executive director. She was in her third year at the time. Joe Payne was still our Casco Bay keeper. You're in year 14, maybe then, uh, and uh, I was just inspired by their uh, community-oriented approach to uh, protecting our environment, and I jumped at the chance. 16 years later, uh, I've grown with the organization, and it's honored to be uh, ex chosen as, by the board as executive director. And over, uh, over the years, some of my best memories are those with my family and my friends. My wife, Rose, is over here, my daughter, Athena. Hi, uh, you too. Uh, along Casco Bay, or with our staff on Casco Bay, whether working uh, or playing on Casco Bay, these moments are touchstones for me in this work. So I bring to this work a passion for hard, uh, hard work from growing up on a farm and a long-term perspective growing up on a farm. I bring a community organizer's optimism and I bring this commitment to the Bay that I've been working to protect for the past 16 years, so thank you. <laughs> and uh, we, are, we, are the, we are the water, we are the Bay. Uh, Gary Lawless wrote that poem. Uh, it's, it's in this annual report. I'm not gonna read it, but I encourage you to read it to each other, especially after you've had a glass of wine tonight. Go, go out on the lawn and read it to each other. Uh, it's great, but it, it really predicted some of the work that we're doing. Uh, uh, it's, it starts uh, rising in the mountains, the water finding its way from granite to the bay. Without using the words watershed, this poet describes the watershed, describes Bethel, the mountains, and the headwaters of the Presumpscot uh, flowing, flowing down to the bay. We are water. We want to flow. Uh, this past year, we have spent uh, well, we've spent several years really working on stormwater, which boy wants to flow. This <laughs> stormwater is washing all the bad stuff off our land into our streams and rivers and eventually making it into the bay. Tonight we're celebrating the Clean Water Act. We're celebrating a big victory this past year. Uh, we got new Clean Water Act stormwater laws for our most urban areas in Casco Bay and in Maine. And Ivy fought hard on that and worked with a lot of communities on that, and uh, we got those new uh, stormwater regulations. So thank you, Ivy. <laughs> and you'll, you'll hear about uh, some Clean Water Act milestones tonight from Ivy uh, by key partners of ours who we are giving uh, the Casco Bay Awards to. The Casco Bay Award for uh, for people who have gone above and beyond their job description to protect these waters that we love. So you'll hear from Ivy about that. The final part 
uh, I want to share is a bunch of thank you. We've already thanked Abby and Matt. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah. And I want to thank Slim Scott the Blues, Charlie Bernstein and the band playing out here. And I want to thank our water reporters. These are volunteers to help us keep an eye on the bay. If you are a water reporter using a water reporter app on your phone, raise your hand. Keep your hand. Let's give these people a round of applause. And also, uh, our past staff. So Joe Payne, our first staff person and baykeeper is here. Peter Milholland is back there, our uh, water quality uh, program coordinator for many years. Marlo Zando is here, used to work in our development team. There's Marlo. Uh, Mary Cirillo might be here. Uh, Tom O'Connor, a bunch of our staff. Most of our staff stay until they retire. Those who don't, and even those who do retire, uh, most of our staff continue to be friends of the Bay, volunteering for us and donating to us. It's really kind of incredible. We stand on your shoulders, so thank you. Uh, and then a last uh, thank you. If you have ever don donated a dollar, $35, $100, $1,000, or uh, the largest gift we've the past year, $75,000, uh, if you've ever donated to us, raise your hand. Thank you. You have made this work possible. Thank you. Uh, and my final thank you is to our current staff. We have an incredibly talented, imaginative, and dedicated staff. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, new folks. Um, Alicia Richards, our, our, our intern, she's way back there somewhere. Yay. Uh, Chris Gilday, our pump out coordinator, takes a lot of crap and uh, is literally uh, kept out, uh, thousands of gallons already this summer out of the bay, running our pump out boat. Uh, Sarah Lyman, where's Sarah? Sarah. Sarah's been with us for 11 years, uh, most recently our community engagement coordinator. I wanna announce tonight that she's been promoted as our development director. So thank you, Sarah, for stepping up to that new challenge. Uh, our staff writer uh, and uh, office manager, uh, uh, Robbie Lewis Nash and Jeff Federer couldn't be here tonight. But Susan Bosco is here as our development uh, assistant. How you doing, Susan? I want to thank, and you, everyone in this room should thank him and grab him a beer tonight. Mike Doan, where are you? Mike has been on staff. Mike has been on staff for 26 years. Our organization 33 years old. He's been on staff for 26 years and still looks younger than all of us. So, a staff scientist, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, uh, Ivy, did I miss? I want to thank I. Oh, I do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, also, she hasn't even started with us yet. Heather, stand up. Heather, Heather Kenyon is uh, helping us uh, expand our, our science and baykeeping work. She is going to be our science and advocacy associate. She's starting in August, and uh, we are so excited to have her aboard as staff. <laughs> and, of course, our Casco Baykeeper, Ivy Frinoka. Uh, Ivy uses uh, clean water, clean, our environmental laws, environmental policy, and creative and effective ways to protect our waters. She calls herself the Lorax of the Bay. I think of her as our community's environmental conscience. And uh, I'm going to turn the, the keynote over to Ivy, your Casco Baykeeper, folks, Ivy Frinoka. I'd love to say I can hold this and talk, but I can't talk without my hands. <laughs> so um, give me a moment here. Uh, 
All right, can you hear me? Good evening and welcome. I am so glad to see you all in person. This year's theme for our annual meeting is We Are Water. And that theme acknowledges that indigenous people lived along the shores of Casco Bay for years in harmony with the bay. The theme also acknowledges that our marine resources are held in trust by the state of Maine for the benefit of all, including wild species. And those concepts resonate with how we protect Casco Bay. We listen to the bay by collecting unbiased data and by observing it year round. You help us with that, especially our water reporters who document changing conditions throughout the year. We take that information and use it to inform actions to improve and protect the health of Casco Bay. On the one hand, we are the number one threat to the bay. From excess greenhouse gas emissions to toxics and plastic pollution and so much more. On the other hand, we are the solution. We can do this. We can nurture and live in harmony with the Bay, and all of you help us take actions that do that. We have accomplished a lot, and we have a lot of work left to do. One of the main tools we use to do our work is the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act was crafted by Maine Senator Muskie and passed 50 years ago. In the last 50 years, it's done a lot to reduce industrial and wastewater pollution. But at 50, it hasn't done everything. We still have a lot of challenges from stormwater pollution and urban development, and from new threats from climate change. There's a lot left to do, but tonight we're here to celebrate what has happened and to recognize the accomplishments of three people who have made a tremendous difference to the health of Casco Bay. The three problems they have helped us tackle are nitrogen pollution, stormwater pollution, and climate change. These award recipients have done their work without seeking praise, although we're gonna give it to them tonight, with tremendous skill, with fortitude, and with passion. To each of them, I owe a personal debt of gratitude. Each has taught me so much and help make me a better steward and voice for Casco Bay. The first problem is nitrogen pollution. And nitrogen's a fertilizer, and in a salt water environment, the right amount of nitrogen, the natural amount of nitrogen fertilizes phytoplankton blooms and alg algae blooms and plants and helps form the base of the food web. When too much nitrogen enters the bay, from car exhaust, fertilizers, and wastewater, it creates excessive phytoplankton and macroalgal blooms. Macroalgal blooms. Oh, it's been a long time since I've had to do this kind of public speaking. <laughs> so, so, sorry about that. So phytoplankton, those tiny little things like red tide, and so some of those blooms close down our shell fisheries. They also cloud the water, and in clouding the water, they impact the health of our eelgrass beds. Eelgrass is critical fish habitat. It's important to a healthy casco bay. Macroalgae blooms are those big green mats of algae you see that grow in coves around Casco Bay, and those smother clam flats. Both the excess phytoplankton blooms and macroalgae blooms, when they die, release carbon dioxide, which acidifies our coastal waters. That makes it harder for shellfish to form their shells and to mature. So our first award goes to Scott Furman. Scott works for the Portland Water District, and he is the, um, let me get this title right, he is the Director of Wastewater Services, and he oversees the operations of sewage treatment plants for six communities in the greater Portland area. Three of those facilities, Peaks Island, Cape Elizabeth, and the East End facility in Portland, discharge directly into Casco Bay. At all three, Scott has implemented changes 
in how the facilities operate to reduce their nitrogen loading to Casco Bay. At the East End plant alone, in the last four years, not including this year, I haven't seen that data yet, but I'm sure I'll see it soon, in four years, that change in operations kept over 1.5 million pounds of nitrogen out of Casco Bay. That's incredible. It's incredible. We're seeing less algal blooms. The eelgrass beds are rebounding near the vicinity. And our data is showing that the nitrogen levels in the vicinity of the outfall are lower. That's amazing. And Scott's work doesn't stop there. At the Westbrook facility, we've been working to up see if we can upgrade the, the last freshwater segment of the Presumpscot River before head of tide from class C to class B. And what class B does is it locks in a higher amount of oxygen in the water. And that's what we want for fish habitat, right? That's critical to restoring our, our, our fisheries in, in, our, in, the, in the river. And what Scott's working with us on this summer is that inside the Westbrook facility, while he's upgrading the facility and the aeration basins there, he's running tests to see if he can operate that plant to account for future urban growth and meet a higher water quality standard. And we're very grateful to Scott to undertaking those tests and we look forward to, to seeing the results. On a personal note, I met Scott when I, in my first few months as Casco Baykeeper when the East End permit was up for renewal. And we were really pushing for nitrogen uh, criteria in the permit. And um, Scott taught me so much. He, he, he let me tour the plant. Uh, he sat down. He, he explained to me about what he does. Um, we had a lot of difficult conversations during which I told Scott, um, don't ever have these conversations with me while I'm caffeinated. Um, <laughs> I need to be on decaf when we talk. And uh, ultimately, um, Scott came up with the, the solution that was, has been implemented to such great success. So um, for always being willing to have the hard conversations, for everything you do, for your incredible sense of humor, uh, we couldn't be more grateful to Scott. I'd like to call him up and present him with this award. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ivy. Uh, thank you for those kind words. My name got mentioned a lot tonight, too many times. I've got a team of wonderful people uh, that make possible what we do. Our board supports us. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. So the second issue we're here to address tonight or talk about is stormwater pollution, which Will talked about a little bit. And there are so few ways to really address this insidious source of pollution. Under natural conditions, stormwater and snow melt is absorbed by, by plants and filters through the ground before it reaches our uh, groundwater and, and surface waters. But when humans clear trees and, and, and build the environment and put in parking lots and roadways and rooftops and alter stream beds, that, that changes how the hydrology works. And what it means is that when snow melts or s storms occur, the water sheets off the landscape instead of percolating, and it carries with it all the modern waste that's on the landscape, whether that's from cars or whatever, whatever's on the landscape. It ends up in our waterways, and that's, that's so difficult to tackle. Um, but uh, <laughs> again, another sign of uh, not talking for a while. If I do something on both sides, I can't just keep turning this page over <laughs> to go on to the next page. So, um, so our second award goes to 
to Fred Dillon, who I'm sure will be as humble as Scott, but also really deserves recognition. Fred works as the stormwater coordinator for the city of South Portland. He has held this position for 13 years. He has worked with us to monitor the water quality and polluted urban streams. He has found sources of pollution and eliminated them. He has been a proponent of and has helped develop South Portland's fertilizer and pesticide ordinances. We think they're the best in the state and they're becoming models for other municipalities. He has trained and led volunteer water quality monitoring efforts of the Presumpscot River. He's worked to restore Long Creek out by the main mall and put in place unique techniques to reduce things like chloride pollution. He's gone so far as to hire goats to eat invasive species along a shoreline park instead of using pesticides. He co-founded the Maine Water Environment Association's stormwater section. They were primarily a wastewater organization. And he's done so much more. If there's the word stormwater in the title of something, even if it's just people getting together for coffee, Fred is there. When I feel discouraged working on this issue, because it's really hard to address stormwater pollution, he is a person I call to mind for inspiration. So to this tireless advocate who works humbly, diplomatically, fervently, and with a great sense of humor, we issue a huge thank you to Fred Dillon. And this is Fred here. <laughs> That's, that's my better angle, I think so. But, but like Scott, I mean, I have a team. My, my two bosses are here tonight, my, my boss from work and my boss from life, my wife boss, I guess so. And, uh, but yeah, thanks, thanks so much for this. I really appreciate it. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of great work in, in municipalities all over the state that are, that are equally deserving of this. And I'm sure they'll be, if they're in the Pasco Bay uh, watershed, they'll be here next year, hopefully. So thank you. I told you these recipients are not looking for the limelight. They just really do the work. Um, so our, our uh, final issue is climate change. And this one's, this one's really a doozy. Our, our watershed is, um, is changing in response to the myriad effects of excess greenhouse gas emissions from rising ocean temperature, um, more precipitation followed by interspersed with periods of drought, more intense storms, shifting species, ocean acidification, uh, all, all of these issues. And because it is uncertain how effective the world will be at reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, it is it's very difficult to figure out <laughs> how to solve a problem that we, the, the magnitude of is, is, is hard to imagine with certainty. And this, does not excuse us from acting. It, it, it means we must exhibit fortitude to be part of the solution. So our final award goes to Dan Devereaux, who exhibits such fortitude and has been a successful climate change champion in, in Eastern Casco Bay. Um, Dan honorably served in the Navy until 1995. He was stationed in part in Brunswick and became very ensconced in the community. At the end of his military service, he applied to be shellfish warden in Harpswell. Now, he did not have experience in shellfish management or knowledge of shellfish laws, but he had a military background, and he was an internationally recognized bodybuilder. So when he walked into the Harpswell office, he was hired. He then used his keen intelligence, ability to learn quickly, and his passion to turn this law enforcement position into a broader vocation. After two years with Harpswell, he left to become the Marine Resources Officer for Brunswick. Dan embraced his new position. He made himself a shellfish expert. He learned about coastal management. He developed networks so that Marine Resource Officers and Harbor Masters could all work collaboratively and share information and work on solutions together. He embraced water quality monitoring. He learned how to use equipments and how to interpret data 
to inform management decisions. He has advocated in the legislature and served on many shellfish committees. I, I can't even list them all. He was a founding member of the State Shellfish Advisory Council. He served on the Harbor Masters Board of Directors. He helped create the Municipal Shellfish Officers Association. He serves on the management team for the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. He serves on Brunswick's Marine Resources Committee and Coastal Waters Commission, and on the Casco Bay Regional Shellfish Working Group. Basically, if shellfish is in the title of the mission, Dan's involved. He's also actively participated in and supported our efforts to address ocean and coastal acidification, including being a very active member of the Maine Ocean and Coastal Acidification Partnership. He has worked with local students on resource experiments in outdoor classrooms, and he created a special licensing program for the Brunswick School System that allows students to hold shellfish licenses and harvest shellfish after school and learn about the industry and how to be good stewards. He did his job so well that Brunswick created a coastal resources manager position that Dan now holds, and there's a division of employees who work with him. He has trained other marine o resource officers who now also conduct water quality monitoring and take a holistic approach to marine resources that goes well beyond law enforcement. When I started as Casco Bay Keeper, Dan got me out on the water and taught me about his world. He introduced me into networks, I'm not sure would have even talked to me otherwise, that made it possible for, for me to do my job well. He loaned us equipment and got me out on airboats, his airboat, to see parts of the bay that weren't accessible to us otherwise. It is with great pleasure that we present this third and final award to Dan Devereaux. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to be as humble. <laughs> but thanks, Fred, for being humble. I um I actually prepared something because um this is a real uh, special night for me because um of the date, um the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. I mean. When I was born, rivers were burning. So um, yeah, that's how um, much change we've seen in these 50 years. Really amazing work that we've done. But like Will and Ivy say, our work is just starting. It's not done. Um, we need to continue to move the goalposts forward. So. Um, I prepared a little written speech, and I may go away from that. I'm not nearly as polished as Ivy. I am the shellfish man, so you can see that I've <laughs> got the oysters on. I'm a big believer. Oysters are keystone species in our environment. Shellfish are biofilters. Very, very important that we maintain those populations in our upper base. So um, thank you very much for this award. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, Will... Ivy, the entire team at the Friends of Casco Bay, um, the retired employees, Joe Payne, amazing, amazing people, amazing network of people, and where they have come from the beginning. I've been working um, almost 30 years now in the Bay, so I've been around just about as long as, as Casco Bay, uh, uh, um, the Friends of Casco Bay have been in, in operation. In, from the start to where we are now and to where we're going is just amazing. It really is with the science and using the science to figure out things. And um, the, bay is, the bay is hard to figure out. Um, uh, she's, um, she's a stubborn one sometimes. So um, uh, I appreciate being called up here. Um, I appreciate the bay. Um, I, won't make this too long, but I have to tell the story about Ivy um, and about Joe. Um, so Joe, um, anybody that knows Joe looks like he stepped right out of the book Moby Dick, right? <laughs> Especially uh, 20 years ago. I mean, it's big, beard, you know. Um, so my first impression of a baykeeper when I met the Casco Baykeeper was Joe Payne. 
Um, so I had this mental image burned in my mind of what a baykeeper should look like. Because, you know, being an internationally recognized bodybuilder for years, um, it's all about the looks, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, when Joe decided um, that it was time to, um, to move on and enjoy other parts of the life and actually go out on the bay and not have to worry about things, um, I was really concerned about and interested in who in the hell is going to do Joe Payne's job. So um, I pondered and I thought, and I was like, geez, you know, who's going to do Joe Payne's job? That's a really hard job, especially considering all of the climate issues were coming. At that point, we were looking at a lot of different climate issues. We were looking at a lot of development in the watershed. We were looking at a green crab invasion and the water temperature is warming like nobody's business, right? So we got a lot of issues we got to address. Who's going to do it? So months go by, um, and I finally get this call from a lady named Ivy. She calls me up, and she says, is Dan there? She calls my office, and this is Dan. Hi, this is Ivy. And if anybody's talked to Ivy on the phone, you think she's kind talking in this thing? Talked to her on the phone. Her phone, phone, her, her phone voice is really kind. It's like, wow. Oh, she is like, I'm the new baykeeper. And I'm like, awesome. Let's get up here and we'll get you out on the airboat and we'll. So we make a date. Ivy comes up and uh, we took her out. And I was, of course, battling with these images in my mind of what a baykeeper should look like. <laughs> and when I saw Ivy, I'm like, okay. Um, what, what do we do here? So, um, so, so Ivy and I spent about six to eight hours at low tide. So you don't get to access Northern Casco Bay at low tide unless you have one of those annoying loud airboats. Um, and that's something that we use as um, machinery to get out onto the flats. We don't do them to purposely annoy people but we do them to get out on the flat so we can actually cover so much ground with those things. But anyway, we took Ivy out on that. We showed her all of the upper reaches of the bay, um, talked about all of the issues that we're having in terms of the reduction in shellfish, the, the ocean acidification, the sea level rise and channel widening, and all of the list goes on and on about the, the eelgrass degradation, the, fishing practices that we were practicing, that we were questioning locally. So when we got done with that trip, um, and I'm about to end my story, I see a lot of fans going, um, I drop Ivy off, we get off the boat, and Ivy's walking away, and I'm thinking to myself, now I've, now I've talked to Ivy, and so I've learned a little bit about Ivy's background and where she comes from, which um, is the um, Conservation Law Foundation, and <clears throat> From what I understand, her nickname there was Pitbull. So, so my, my, my mind and what a baykeeper should be started to change at that point. And when it really changed is when, I, when Ivy turned around and she's walking out, the, you know, she's walking with the lanyard and she turns around to me and she's looking at me. And what I was wearing that day was this big green jacket. And I always, you know, like to identify myself obviously, um, but it had police on the back, big, bold letter, police. So when I'm out there, people know that I'm the cops, right? I'm, I'm the law. And, and so she turns around and she looks at me and she goes, I need one of those. And I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? You need an airboat? Really? That is so cool. And she's like, no, I need one of those jackets. People need to know that I'm the bay keeper. And so at that point, I knew that we had selected the right person to do the job, to lead us into the future, and um, to really be confident. So I am really confident in this board and Ivy to do the right thing and lead us into the future, but it's gonna take every one of us. So I appreciate you guys who donate to Friends of Casco Bay and, and, and what we do as a group because this problem needs to be tackled by each and every one of us. So I can't thank you enough for this award.
not going to do the rest of my prepared remarks. I, 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 think, uh, I think Dan nailed it. And um, one other fun fact you may not know, since he kind of did a little tiny roast of me, there was. Um, a lot of people thought that. Like, how is she going to be the next Joe Payne? And I will tell you what I said back then. I am a big person, too. I'm just in a small body. <laughs> I will do the job. So um, really, though, we're not here for me. We're here to celebrate these people and to thank all of you for all of your support, um, financial and otherwise, and for all of your assistance with helping us fulfill the mission. So I just want to conclude by saying we are the water. Thank you. Great. Just take a, a few more minutes uh, of your time. Uh, where are we going now, uh, friends of Casco Bay? Well, we're going to keep protecting the bay. And uh, one thing that's coming up that we need all of your help on is on Sunday, August 7th, we're going to nab nitrogen. Sunday, August 7th at 9.30 in the morning, all around Portland Harbor, Portland, South Portland, Cushing Island Peaks, Little Diamond Island, uh, and people in kayaks and boats uh, in Portland Harbor will have a, uh, 150 to 200 volunteers at 9.30 a.m. that day, stick their a bottle in water, all at the same time, take, take a sample. We need more volunteers for that. So if you are free August 7th, Sarah Lyman is back there. Talk to Sarah and sign up. We need your help. Where else are we going? If you're uh, a donor to us, Please give again, uh, right? Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. It's what makes us able to do this work and uh, and and support the work that uh, that we are that we're doing. We're working on tap tackling climate change, and we're working on uh, expanding our work, um, working with river groups. Uh, Ivy uh, talked about working with uh, friends of the Presumpscot. We're working with other river groups uh, in the Bay. The cleaner those rivers are, the healthier Casco Bay is going to be. Uh, and uh, key to that uh, is uh, Mike and Ivy uh, working with uh, community groups uh, upriver. And uh, coming up, our board will be tackling our next five-year strategic plan. So we're going to be coming back to you and, and talking to you about that in coming months. So uh, a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, we are water. We are the bay. What happens to water happens to us. And eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you so much for coming.